So let's start with our uh, motivation. And really reflecting on uh, impermanence, the fact that things do not remain the same in the very next second. that there's no way to stop the change. And so rather than fight it, better to adapt to it. And change uh, doesn't have to be something negative because the fact that things change moment by moment, also indicates that we can improve the state of our mind moment by moment. So to have that mind that accepts change, that understands it's coming, best would be a mind that is not surprised when big changes happen. But that's going to take some work. In any case, nirvana is a state where that is permanent, that does not change. So it's quite peaceful. And a fully awakened Buddha has that kind of nirvana, that peace, that dwelling in the ultimate nature, and also has a mind that changes moment by moment, that is aware of all existence, all objects of knowledge throughout the universe, and aware especially of the aptitudes and dispositions and interests of all sentient beings, which makes the Buddha able to be the best guide that we can follow. So with a deep refuge in the Buddha as our guide, as our refuge, and with a deep aspiration to become a Buddha ourselves, to benefit others most effectively. And let's share the Dharma together this evening. Okay, so I wanted just to finish up. We've been working on these 10 destructive actions for a long time. It'd be nice to finish them up and be done with them, huh? So um, I think we, we kind of completed the verbal ones last time, pretty much. And so we have the mental ones now, coveting and malice and wrong views. And so trying to think of them, uh, you know, we know the standard mm, descriptions pretty much. But to think of how these things uh, can be done uh, in modern age are, are new, improved ways of creating mental negativities. So coveting, I think this is, is one where really uh, technology has helped a lot. Yeah, we can covet more and better than ever before because we have so much communication, don't we? And uh, you know, so constantly, you know, even you try and read the newspaper uh, online, there's ads. Almost everything you go to, there's ads. Uh, you know, you want to watch just a trailer for a movie, there's ads. Wherever you drive from one place to another, there's billboards. Um, you know, again and again, we are bombarded with um, things telling us that we are not good enough, we do not look 
nice enough, we do not have enough, or we don't have enough of the things that are in now, okay, because fashions are constantly changing. And so really increasing within us this mind of covetousness that is always wanting more and better and more and better. Yeah. So this is our society, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and we live here at the Abbey. We really regulate our contact with the media. But even within that, <clears throat> look how much you know, we're exposed to advertising and so on. You know, you just pick up the mail and there's all sorts of stuff. Okay? So, uh, you know, the effect of advertising publicity, uh, you know, you open your inbox and there's, you know, now even for Dharma items, there's so much advertising by this new meditation cushion, you know, you need your right yoga clothes. You need to write Dharma clothes. There's online dating for Dharma friends, you know. Yeah, there's this picture, you know, in the, in the magazine about renunciation with this beautiful woman and handsome guy holding hands, looking at each other with, you know, a Buddha statue. And, <laughs> you know, advertising the, the Buddhist online dating. Um, you know... <laughs> So, I mean, even within Buddhism, it's just chock-a-block full of advertising, isn't it? Even for Dharma events, you know, the best, the, the highest, the, you know, most accurate, the this, the that, you know, uh, how Dharma events are, are advertised or how teachers are advertised. And uh, I find it really... Uh, rather unpleasant, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Because, as I understand it, advertising actually started out as just announcing to people where they could find certain things if they needed those things. And then it changed into creating a need that wasn't there initially so that people would go and purchase those things. And so to really see that come into uh, Buddhism, I just, uh, I find quite unpleasant. Okay, so uh, in terms of of new, improved ways to covet advertising, of course shopping, advertising goes together with shopping. And now you can shop online. And... We find here, even at the Abbey, there's some people who are constantly receiving packages from FedEx, from, I won't mention names, but I observe who gets the most packages. Um, You know, toilet paper is one thing, but, um, yeah. But, uh, you know, and, and so just this mind that is like, well, if I can get something online, this feeling like I need to buy something. So as a monastic, you know, I mean, what are you going to buy? They don't stock a new donka at, at Macy's, you know, and they don't have, uh, you know, a new a new Shemdop at Saks Fifth Avenue or even at Kmart, you know. <laughs> they don't sell malas at, at, at uh, Walgreens or, you know, Walmart. Uh, but, you know, in, in our work, you know, oh, there, this little computer something I could use, or this little thing, or something new for the kitchen, or something new for the office. You know, there's always this mind that, uh, you know, wants more and more better, even if it's just some small thing, you know. We're so influenced by advertising. Yeah? And, and you can look, you know, it's like, oh, we need more of these little tables to, you know, uh, put our computers on when we listen to teachings. It's for Dharma. Yeah? We need this. Because you know, the present table we have, you know, it's not really so good. And this and that and the other thing. Okay? So, um, 
Yeah. <laughs> okay, so advertising, shopping. Um, maybe being involved with everything. But that's not really coveting. That would be more idle talk. I think a lot of technology involves us also in idle talk, you know, because we want to read all these different things that are... Some of the things in the paper are really good and we need to learn about, but then we get hooked on, uh, you know, the kind of inconsequential things, the more gossipy items, you know. So to really uh, be careful about that. So what other ways do you think there are for coveting? Coveting being a mental attitude. We don't really even have to do anything, but just that thing of wanting and planning how to get. Now, what are new ways, do you think, in society that I mean, uh, besides the fact that there's just more things to want now than there were before. Um, I think maybe coveting opportunities or this whole resume building culture that starts from a very young age. Mm -hmm. I was thinking my boss had to create a resume for her seven-year-old son to get into the right elementary school. So she had to go and get a testimonial from the robotics teacher from kindergarten <laughs> to get him a place in. And I was like, you have robotics in kindergarten? <laughs> How is this even working? Yeah. So, you know, he's seven and he has a resume. Wow. <laughs> so coveting, uh, coveting status, basically, or coveting opportunities. Yeah, what else? Sales. Sales. Stale. Sales. Um, where you have shopping and then they have... They have they plan. Sale. sale. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sales. And you plan for it. Right. <laughs> yes, the day after Thanksgiving, we all know, go run for the stores. <laughs> uh -huh. There's coveting fame and mm -hmm. likes on different sites where there's an opportunity to get likes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, that's you really see that with the young people now. You know, everybody uh, wants to be famous on Facebook. Yeah, so coveting, yeah, coveting fame. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the wherewithal and the finances traveling and getting to the next m most exotic place, uh. Yeah. And you get there, and it just isn't as exotic as you thought, so you have to keep going, yeah. finding the next best place. Yeah. Yeah. So even if you don't travel, the mind is coveting the travel. The, yeah, it's like uh, an increase of the daydreaming mind, how I can be famous, how I can have far-out experiences. That was the thing when, when I was young. It's like... You know, I want to, because if you could have far out experiences, then you really had status, you know? Yeah. So I was one of the people who went to India. That wasn't the only reason I went to India. But, um, you know, uh, hardly anybody went to India in 1973. Yeah, hardly anybody. But I went to India, you know? And it brings you a certain amount of status amongst your friends that you went to some exotic place. Or when you're traveling, talking with other um, travelers, and the, the coveting of, of a good reputation amongst the other travelers, who's been to the most far out places, who knows in detail the best cheap hotels to stay at, and the best restaurants to eat at, you know. So very much this whole coveting of, of, yeah, reputation, fame, yeah, appearance. Planning for the um, Dharma teachings in different places, collecting initiations. What was the collecting what? 
initiations. Initiations, so yeah. Yeah, <laughs> very much. Yeah, coveting, yeah, very much, you know. Coveting the status that comes from, you know, having initiations, going to different teachings or whatever. So like coveting security, all the financial institutions ah. are selling these packages, retirement packages, and long-term health care. And, and, yeah. Making it seem like you can pre prevent against every contingency in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coveting some kind of security. Mm -hmm. um, someone online said coveting having things our own way. <laughs> no, that's not coveting. That is simple self-centered mind. <laughs> yeah, coveting generally replies, applies to cover, coveting objects. But here we're, all, you know, if we have uh, our, our coveting uh, fame and stuff like that, it's kind of like as I was saying before, that they are not physical objects, but we know those things through sense, our senses. So they all have to do with, you know, some kind of sensual desire as well. Okay, now what about malice? You know, new ways. So malice is the mind that is upset, angry, you know, that is planning revenge, that wants to uh, get even. You know, it's not simple a simple thought of anger floating through our mind, but it's a really, uh, you've already gone to the planning stages. And so here I was thinking a lot um, of malice can easily arise nowadays regarding the political situation. That whether you say something, whether you say harsh words, whether you say divisive speech, that speech, but ma mental, malice, you know, just ruminating how much we dislike certain people who have power or how stupid or ineffective we feel those people are. And the mind can really get quite entangled with all of this, you know. And uh, especially, you know, nowadays people... It's, it's interesting when you... When you have this kind of despair about the world or upset about the state of the world, it's hard to think, oh, that's malice and I'm creating negative karma. Yeah, it, that one's hard to recognize as a defilement because it's what we often call righteous anger. Yeah. Isn't it? So righteous anger can really be uh, malice. That's why, you know, we have to be quite careful. I know that people will say, but his holiness, when asked about righteous anger, sometimes he says, yeah, you know, that's good. But I've only heard his holiness um, say anything about for different forms of anger being acceptable when he's teaching Westerners. In, when he's teaching in Asia, he never says that. So I think he says that because the, of the mentality of the people here. You know, that the whole idea of righteous anger is so uh, entrenched in the culture that it's hard for people to think that anger is anger, even if it's for a good cause. Yeah, That the cause itself does not make the anger virtuous. Yeah. But that's a tricky one, because we like to think that if the cause is virtuous, then the anger that's propelling us in that direction must also be virtuous. And here I find that, that people uh, think that uh, anger is the only thing that can get them to act without realizing that there's 
a whole variety of different motivations that can motivate them to act. It doesn't have to be anger. What other new, improved forms of malice do you think we have? (laughs) Yeah. We talked about it last week, and I went back to the BBC that I did on the young adult's mental health um, form that Venerable Sompton and I went to, and it was called Burn Books. Mm -hmm. It's an anonymous hate text messaging that you can't delete, so if you have something harsh or demeaning to say about somebody, you send these hate messages via this app called Burn Books, and they can't delete what you said about them. And they say it's one of the main causes for some of these suicides in these young people is either through bullying or shaming or threatening or demeaning them. But there's an app that you can't delete what goes around about you. And it's called Burn Books. And you don't have to sign your name when you send it, but you you can point it at somebody. You can send it to somebody. Oh, my goodness. On a phone. Why would somebody make an app like that? Similar to that, like you were just saying, there's another one that's it's city by city and it's a website called The Dirty that you could do the same type of thing where somebody can't delete whatever they say about you. And I mean, it's the same type of thing, but it's every single city in America has one. Hmm. So does that mean if somebody posts something online, it can never be deleted? Right. Okay. Yeah. Web, there's a website called RateMyTeacher.com, and so rate, yeah. So you oh, can rate. rate a teacher, but uh-huh. you know, uh, some pretty negative things come out there from disgruntled yeah. students, and yeah. it can hurt someone's career. Yeah. Okay. So online rating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And actually, trolling too, isn't it? I mean, trolling is actually speech, but it starts in the mind where you start ruminating about somebody and wanting to ruin their reputation or shame them or whatever. Uh, There is one form which can be like a combination of trolling and prank calling in an extreme way where somebody calls like the SWAT team on somebody they don't like and their house actually gets raided. Oh my goodness. Yes. And it's usually done online, and now especially in a video game world, they go to extremes like that. Wow. Yes. I don't know what this is called, but I noticed during the election um, that when I would go into my email, Mm -hmm. that on the side, these things would pop up with really nasty pictures of one of the political candidates making that person look really bad, and they wouldn't even say much. They'd just be like a really nasty picture. It seems a very harsh thing to do. Yeah, and actually some of the things that um, the the good organizations, the the organizations that have the same views as we do, with the things they send around, sometimes the way they're worded, I really do not like. Demand this and that. You know, or just the harsh, the harsh speech. Again, this is going back to speech, but it's coming from the mind. So there was some malice beforehand. But uh, yeah, the way, yeah, and in your petitions, the way they, the harshness with which they write things to try and get you to sign a petition. Yeah. Yeah, there's just new ways to do it now. I mean, we just we have so much more contact with peop- with other people now. Yeah. So these are things that that we really need to be careful of in our life, because otherwise, you you can easily sit and stew with malice about somebody and plan how to ruin their reputation, how to get even how to bully somebody, yeah. Of course, bullying, again, is speech, but it starts out with malice in the mind. And then wrong views. Oh, somebody have something? 
also with all the entertainment culture, you get both covetousness and malice whipped up, right? So, like you're crazy about some celebrity or... Uh, my mother would bond with people on the bus talking about some character in a soap opera they all hated and how that person <laughs> deserved to die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Very much, yeah. The media in general uh, whips up a lot of coveting and malice in our mind. And movies, you know I mean, they do this deliberately because that's what keeps us hooked watching the movie. If there isn't a crisis point that evokes some strong emotion, usually an afflictive emotion, every few minutes, then we get bored and f change the, the channel. Yeah? So they, they uh, entertainment is very much involved with coveting and malice. Could you press? I was thinking also that um, Watching movies and people that have malice and then act on their malice and do, you know, terrible things is one thing. And I, you know, I kind of grew up with that. But nowadays, you can get involved in that, like with a video game, and do the actions to carry out, even though it's, you know, imaginary. But nonetheless, that you are completing that whole process of malice, uh -huh. planning what, and then doing. I think that is very powerfully uh, affecting, yeah. uh, especially kids' minds. You think it's in games? Yeah. 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 Games. Yeah. And um, I was thinking also threat making threats to people online. Uh, you know, that you... You may mean or you may not mean, but you think it's just fun to make somebody else afraid. Music. Music, some, some lyrics of some songs in a lot of yeah. genres. It doesn't have to be a particular genre, but they, um, and as people are singing those lyrics, they are evoking yeah, yeah. They're evoking these feelings yeah, and these yeah. states of mind that are just very malicious and hateful and yeah, very disturbing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you have the energy of the music itself and then you have the lyrics. Yeah, which you may be a passive listener, but it evokes those kind of thoughts in you. And those thoughts turn around and they can affect your dreams as well. Just through all the various kinds of media, there's there's a lot of um, people we hear about who we really don't know, and we hear these things about them. And so it's easy, if we hear negative things about them, to have a negative view of somebody, and we don't even really know them as a person, mm -hmm. so that we can um, you know, be able to have compassion for them and see them as a suffering, sentient being. Yeah. And so all these forms of things are really just expressions of something similar to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to go on, so this will be the last comment about this topic. I think adding on to that, um, the way the media is now with the like 24-hour cycle of news, yeah. where you keep getting the same news over and over and over and again. Right. So that promotes all the mental afflictions. Yeah. Yeah, the news cycle. Yeah, so we can see, you know, when we talk about this, why we have policies at the Abbey about viewing uh, going online, you know, that it isn't just, uh, we're not being mean and depriving people, but there's a very specific reason for it in terms of our Dharma practice. Because, uh, you know, if you start having a lot of coveting and desire and malice whipped up in your mind from being online, then that's what's going to take over your mind when you're meditating. Is that kind of stuff. Yuck. <laughs> okay. Then there is uh, wrong views. Okay, so these are wrong views is usually denying the existence of something that exists. So denying the existence of the four truths of. Uh, 
you know, Buddha Dharma Sangha of awakening, uh, these kinds of things. And so, you know, the efficacy of our, of our, of karma to produce results and so on. And so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of this again going on online, which is, falls under speech, but it stimulates in our mind a lot of doubt, a lot of, uh, cynicism yeah because we get a lot of information about different things but we don't know how much of it is true we form all sorts of uh, negative views about different people or different systems of belief or whatever without uh, knowing a lot about them yeah so Wrong views kind of proliferate with technology. I was thinking of fake news and news that is more in the category of propaganda rather than actual news mm -hmm. stimulates a lot of wrong views about groups of people or even religious groups and, and political groups, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of biased news. Yeah. That then, you know, creates malice. Thinking of like how the uh, because of the media and technology, you you have people who are charismatic that can reach a large group of people. Yes, and you have those mega groups, right? Who who can uh, proliferate wrong views <laughs> very easily, and collect a lot of money while they're doing it. Thinking about oh. something that wasn't there in the past, um, the religion of science. Mm -hmm. Science wasn't so much around in the previous centuries and the views that come with science sometimes that aren't open-minded towards, uh, like even how in universities uh, for many years you couldn't really study certain topics. And so there's a kind of a mindset that has come with the scientific view as it's been practiced. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think it comes with the scientific method but it comes with the cultural scientific view that we have in the last mm -hmm. hundred years, I would say. Yeah, more. that makes us doubt. Yeah, it makes people like materialist. And, and yeah, so you can't. On. Yeah, yeah you, you can't even think about um, some of these topics that you know, that we hold. Yeah, I was thinking also about the jihadi uh, websites and magazines and so on. You know, wrong views about the virtue of killing infidels and, and so on. That really deceives so many young people. In line with that, there are also people online who will, once you've expressed interest in ISIS, they will keep maintaining contact with yes. you. Yes. And they keep feeding this so that you just really get swayed and yeah. drawn right in. Yeah. yeah. So technology has had its good things and it has... That pass the mic back, but it's also made the propagation of wrong views and all sorts of other harmful things more effective. Um, along with what Venerable Tarpa said about science, and a lot of issues are coming up from misuse of science or science without ethics, like manipulating life by cloning or yeah. a genetic modification or um, using people in trials unknown drugs and things like that. Yeah, a lot of different ethical views. Okay, so have we finished the ten new improved ways of creating negativity. Yeah, but uh, yeah, this one about science, I mean science and technology both are, are uh, we have to look very closely at uh, what they have added to society that benefits and what they've added that just uh, creates more misconception, more suffering. Okay, so um, I would, uh, that's pretty much the first kind of ethical conduct, that of, um, of uh, restraining from negativities. The second one is the ethical conduct of doing virtuous actions 
which I think we've covered before, and the third one, the ethical conduct of benefiting sentient beings, which we went through when we talked about the last several of the uh, auxiliary bodhisattva precepts. So then we come to the third perfection, which is fortitude. And again, explaining why I I choose to use the term fortitude. Not everybody agrees. But um, first of all, patience, I think, implies waiting for somebody. You know, be patient. They'll come, you know. Patience is very much the implication of waiting for someone um, or waiting for something. You know, just chill out, wait, it'll change. Whereas I think fortitude <clears throat> is really making the mind strong. Yeah, it's, it's the process of developing inner strength so that, uh, you know, if you experience criticism, insult, you know, things that would norm- normally make you angry, you have the inner strength not to uh, get angry. That's, that would be the first kind of fortitude. The second one is when you experience suffering. And again, having the inner strength to be able to endure physical, mental suffering without dissolving. And then the third one is the, the fortitude of practicing the Dharma, which is dealing with the difficulties that arise when we practice the Dharma, which as we know, are plentiful. Okay? So the the first one, um, yeah. So, yeah, I like very much thinking of a fortitude as inner strength. Yeah, because to me that patience is just chill out and wait. Fortitude is more active. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, making yourself strong inside so that you can face difficult situations. And that kind of inner strength we really need in the world, yeah? Uh, (laughs) Especially after we just covered all these different ways of creating negativity. Um, But, uh, you know, especially the the first one of uh, the fortitude to endure... Uh, when we're upset, you know, when we're angry. And so uh, some things here, again, I'm I'm trying to, I'm not giving the usual talk on these, I'm trying to bring out some other points that maybe I've been thinking about, so I'm not covering all the points that are usually covered when talking about these things. Um, But I was thinking about there was an idea that just flashed through my mind and then went bye-bye um, about fortitude, about inner strength. Yeah, anyway. Because um, there are so many new ways to get angry. There's so, no, so many new ways to be offended There's so many new ways for people to tell us that they don't like us or don't approve of us. Yeah, because of all this, uh, you know, uh, improved communication things, then in many ways, uh, you know, we really need fortitude now. Because if you think about bullying, you know, bullying used to just happen from people face-to-face. Now you can be bullied by a huge number of people at the same time. Yeah? And so you need to be especially strong to be able to stand up to that and face that and not take it all personally. Yeah, Because we really have a tendency that when somebody criticizes us, uh, we take it personally and we we assume that their evaluation of us is true. Yeah? 
or we're rejecting their evaluation of us as untrue. But if you look at it, why do we get... If something somebody is accusing of us of is blatantly untrue, why do we get angry at it? You know? Could it be that we're, we have secret inner doubt that maybe we do have that quality and it's not untrue? Or is it that we're getting angry because we're concerned that person will tell a whole bunch of people that we have that quality and then our reputation will be ruined? Yeah? So this whole thing of anger and getting upset, it's, it seems to have tentacles out to so many different things. Um, so much so, uh, we were discussing in the car today, that sometimes people find difficulty even identifying anger as anger. Yeah? You know? You're upset. You're unhappy. You're un- upset. You're agitated inside. But you don't call that anger. Yeah? Some people don't identify that as anger. You know, because many people are taught that you're not supposed to get angry, okay, uh, or your anger isn't acceptable, and so then those could be causes for not being able to identify when we're angry, or even being in a family that didn't talk about emotions, so we never learned the words to labor, label how we're feeling. Yeah. But how difficult uh, it can be for some people to acknowledge, I am angry. Yeah. So I think righteous anger may be, be a good example of it. You know, we're so mad at what Trump is doing and what... McConnell is doing and what Ryan is doing. We're so mad. But we don't say, I'm angry. We say, they're doing all these horrible things that are destroying the country. Yeah? And we can't identify that as anger because we're so involved in it being them that, that they're doing something wrong that we can't identify our emotional reaction towards what they're doing. Yeah, do you get what I mean? Yeah? And it can be, you know, it's happening, I think, a lot with political things. It can be on a personal basis, too, you know, that uh, we really, um, you know, are, don't like what somebody's doing or we misinterpreted what they're doing and we're very angry but we don't, don't identify that as anger. We identify it as yeah. that person's picking on me, that person mistreats me, that person does all these mean things to me. Yeah. So we usually think of it as we would say, I am angry because, and then you blame somebody. But for some people, it's just the blame, and they can't see the I am angry part. Yeah, because it's just blame. They're they're wrong. Yeah. Do you ever see yourself being like that? In some ways, unable to say I'm, you know, identify anger and just be stuck in. They're doing this and that. Yeah, well, it's an easy thing to get to get stuck in. <laughs> it's this week. Huh? Just this week. Ah. And what I recognize is sometimes I get kind of a depressed state, and it actually helps me a lot to actually recall that depression is anger turned inwards because I don't find, I have to find the anger. Yeah. And I have to allow myself to have various emotions that anger is associated with. You know, I mean, I, it really helps to, for me to look for sadness, to look for fear, and also to look for the discontent that brings anger up and you know mm-hmm. just those kind of things to sort it out 
Yeah. So you're saying that sometimes it's easier to identify fear, discontent, Actually, I or think whatever, what, what, or? what happens sometimes is really I think I just get depressed. Mm. And I have to, I don't always allow myself to feel those other emotions in order to, like the anger, fear, or hopelessness mm. or those things. Yeah. It's just you're just kind of numb out in this depression instead. Yeah. And you can be thinking about the things outside of you maybe, putting your mind on that. But really what helps me is to remember, oh, anger, depression is anger turned inwards and then start looking at what is really going on here. Mm. You know, inside, forget the, all the outside right. stuff. Yeah, yeah, because that, that is often the difficulty is we're so focused outward that we aren't aware of what's happening inside. Yeah. And yet we're behaving in all sorts of ways that other people say, you know, oh, they're really angry. <laughs> they're really upset because we're behaving like that. But we can't see it. I noticed in some of the ways I was talking about my family during the EML this year uh -huh. that there's uns unfinished business. Yeah. And what I am beginning to recognize is that I am still blaming instead of clearing it up and letting it go. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do that. Yeah. yeah. And this thing about blaming our family, I think, is especially strong since Freud. You know, because Freud kind of attributed all our neuroses to what, you know, things that our parents did. Not all of them, but a great deal of them. And this became culturally popular uh, as a way to explain why we have the problems we have. Uh, and that has some truth to it. But we carry it to such an extreme that then we can never put it down because we can never undo those things and we ruminate about them. And uh, again, because we're so focused external that we don't recognize what our re emotional response is to those things. And it's our emotional response that's the problem now, not what people did to us. Yeah? Because what they did or how they behaved was in the past. The past is not the problem. It's how we're thinking about the past now that is what inhibits us. Because yeah. we, you know, have memories that, are, that we elaborate, that we distort, that we embellish in one way or another. Yeah. And like you said, when, when you see that you're... Uh, hanging on to stuff about your family from years ago, then you can see that, you know, it has very little to do with what's going on now and a lot to do just with the conceptual mind that is making up stories and believing them. And I found that most of, so many of my stories about the past, especially the stories that I use to explain why I have present problems, that those stories are, they're, you know, I think they're quite factual, but I, they're actually, you know, it's like, it's not looking at the, at the whole thing, it's looking at one side and saying that's the whole thing. Yeah, very, very distorted but not recognizing how distorted it is. Yeah? And if somebody else suggests that my way of looking at something in the past is distorted, then I get really upset with them. Yeah? Because you're dismissing my feelings. You know, you're belittling you're not taking seriously my whatever it is. Yeah. But maybe the person's just trying to help us. Yeah. By reminding us, hey, that's just a story. But we get mad at them and say, 
you're not listening, you don't understand, you're dismissing my experience, you're doing you, 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 you. You know? We get so into that. Yeah? But it's, you know, when we can really look and see what happened in the past happened, it's finished, it is not happening now. It's how I am thinking about it and what my emotional response is to that that is creating the present suffering. What I have found, my experience has been that um, for experiences of the past, traumatic experiences, um, I I knowingly um, um, developed uh, habitual patterns of behavior to deal with the feelings arising from those experiences. And what happened was those those ways of dealing that were with the, those experiences were dysfunctional, and I made them into habitual patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving, and they continue with me even after they no longer serve the purpose of helping me deal with a traumatic situation. So I'm stuck with them. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to undo them yeah. so that I can actually um, have a healthier way of relating to my past experiences. Yeah, yeah. Very well put. As you explained it, um, I also feel like uh, all of these afflictions are also related to that victimhood identity or mental uh, affliction. Um, because when somebody, especially in this culture, if they feel as if they are a victim, they feel that their response, even if it is violent, is justified. Yeah. And their quote-unquote self-righteous anger is justified. And I think it's also the way the U.S. operates as a nation, because like um, <laughs> we can look during the Cold War with the Soviets. Yeah. It's always us versus them. Yeah. And then even, for example, after 9-11, the U.S. felt it's a victim, but it started to uh, attack Iraq and Afghanistan, which had nothing to do with 9-11. And in the process, because it felt it was a victim and felt justified in carrying out these violent actions, it created more suffering. Yeah. So the victimhood status, I feel, is very dangerous. And then the U.S., just on an individual basis, we are taught that being a victim and reacting violently or with anger is okay. Mm -hmm. And we're not taught anything at all, any tools, how to surpass that anger or to react in another way. Yeah. We're not taught anything like that. So this is why I believe the Dharma will be able to teach us and give us these tools to overcome hatred with non-hatred, as it says in the Dharma Pada. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we kind of revel in our victim status. <laughs> yeah. Boy, it causes pain, doesn't it? Someone online says that um, sometimes at first I don't want to say to myself that I'm angry because it'll feel like by admitting it, it'll feed the habit of anger um, and also is not giving herself the opportunity to see if it's hurt or shame or grief. Mm -hmm. So kind of just distancing. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, nice present. Nice little wall. We build walls and they don't, we don't have to pass a bill allocating how many billions of dollars. But, uh, yeah, we, we build those little walls. In my own experience, I think also that uh, I don't want to admit when I'm angry because it means I'll have to recognize that my response is unreasonable. And I feel so justified in that moment <laughs> that... I don't want to f say that I'm angry because then I have to say, oh, this might be slightly yeah. exaggerated here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. If you admit you're angry, then it's like saying my response is, is you know, at the moon and, and I'm going to have to give it up. And who wants to do that? <laughs> so along this line, I was also thinking about um, forgiving and apologizing. Uh, because they, they go with this whole topic of anger and fortitude. Mm -hmm. Because 
we will get angry at other people uh, and then want to or feel the need to apologize or um, for their, our anger. And we will get angry at other people and need to forgive them so that we can let go of our own anger. So I think, you know, anger and apologizing, anger and forgiving are, are uh, they're all kind of in the same stew pot. Yeah? Kind of working with each other. And I was thinking a little bit more about forgiveness and kind of asking myself, uh, or not forgiveness, but apologizing. And so often I will apologize for things I've done, but I will not apologize for things I've thought or things I've felt. And sometimes I haven't said or done anything, but the mind has been exploding. Yeah? And I was thinking how, uh, you know, our, our uh, apologies, often it's not clear what we're apologizing for. It's not clear what we're regretting. Yeah? For example, we may think horrible thoughts about somebody and be really angry. But externally, just uh, do some small thing, you know, out of anger towards that person. And then we will apologize for doing the small thing. But the real thing that we need to clean up is all the vengeance and whatever it was, mental disturbance, that promoted that small thing. Yeah? And so I'm not necessarily saying that we should go to the other person and tell them all the negative thoughts that we had about them and then apologize for having those negative thoughts. I'm not advocating that. But I'm saying in terms of our own self-honesty, yeah, to not to say, oh, I need to apologize for what I said, but, you know, we, we inst- and we wouldn't say I need to poli- apologize for what I thought, but I need to purify what I thought. Okay? So purification kind of serves the the same function at, for in terms of mental things as apologizing does. But a purification we also do for physical and verbal things as well. Yeah. Uh, but just how, uh, you know, really looking and when we, when we say we're sorry, to ask ourselves what are we really sorry for? Um, are we being like fully up front with ourselves? Yeah. Like I said, we don't need to go and tell everybody all the negative thoughts we had about them. But to be able to be transparent with ourselves about, um, you know, and owning up to things instead of just saying, well, I apologize, so it's all done. Yeah. You know, I apologize, so. The relationship's made up, but I still have all these seeds of the negative karma of malice on my mind. Yeah, because I haven't really acknowledged that. I've just acknowledged the physical or verbal thing. And so I was thinking about that, and then I was thinking about how Our angry thoughts distance us from other people. And uh, we will get angry if we think somebody else is rejecting us, abandoning us, mistreating us, or whatever. 
we will get angry at them for pushing us away. We'll see them as pushing us away from them through their behavior of what they've said and done towards us. But actually, it's our angry response. With our angry response, we are pushing ourselves away from them. Is this making some sense? That we say to ourselves, their behavior, with their behavior, they are distancing themselves from me. They don't want to be part of this relationship because look at how they're talking to me. Look at what they're doing to me. But actually, when we think like that, our thoughts mean we're distancing ourselves from them and we're the ones who are pulling out from the relationship. Yeah? But how we think that it's them doing something and we're just perceiving it accurately, but it's actually our inaccurate thoughts that are making the problems in the that are distancing ourselves. Is this making some sense to you? Yeah? Yeah. It's very interesting you mentioned that, Venerable, because um, I've been doing some um, contemplation of um, my responses to people. And as a result of some past experiences, I grew to be distrustful of, of people and um, kept myself separate. And my thought about it was, um, I, I'm not safe with a certain amount of people. But at some time in the middle of my life somewhere, that thought changed to, um, they are distancing the, themselves from me because they don't like me. So mm. somewhere in there, mm. that thought was transformed into that. Yeah. And... Um, kept me really um, feeling isolated, but I didn't realize that I was isolating myself. Mm -hmm. And these thoughts that were in my mind, even though they were deep and not necessarily always at the forefront, were affecting my behavior and how I related with people. And the, the distrust and the thought that they didn't like me for some reason was affecting how I... Yeah. And project it into, uh, you know, projecting yeah. into other people. So yeah. it's definitely, I have experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. We express it as, they don't like me, they're pushing me away. But saying that to ourselves is us pushing them away. It's like uh, we're giving ourselves a, a valid, kind of a valid excuse to push them away, you know, yep. subconsciously kind of. Yep. Totally justifiable. It's, again, it's, it's not my responsibility. <laughs> They're doing it. Yeah. It's amazing how when you really look deeply at, at some of these things, how it inevitably comes back to our own mind, doesn't it? Yeah? All this stuff that we think is from outside, how much of it is... You know, it's the origin is inside here. Okay, more comments, questions? Okay, so the, the first uh, kind of fortitude is, you know, that fortitude to uh, endure harm from other people. Yeah, so people's incense, uh, insults, um, beating, their anger towards us, their whatever it is that we don't like, that it's them, they're rejecting us, they're abandoning us, they're there, they're there, they're there. And um, developing an inner strength that, uh, that I want to say endure, but endure connotes Huh? 
bearing, yeah, that you're tight and you're just enduring it. But what fortitude means is uh, it's not a big deal to you. Yeah, it's not like, oh, all this negative negativity is coming towards me, but I am stoic, valor, valor, what's the word, valor, that with val valoriously enduring, you know, what they're doing to me. No, that's not fortitude. Fortitude is just, I think the culmination of fortitude is, this is no big deal, <laughs> you know? You, you even stop seeing it as harm, in a way. Of course, there's many stages to practice before you get there. Yeah. I think that um, uh, developing that inner strength really has so much to do with um, seeing ourselves clearly and having kind of a, a stable base that words or actions of others isn't going to jar that, isn't going to, you know, mm -hmm. that we know who we are and we know so that we keep hold of that inner view of ourselves, kind of. Yeah, the, the thing that I want to be careful about there is it sounds like we're creating an identity and we're holding fast to our identity. And it, it isn't, I know who I am, I have my identity, and I'm not going to let somebody shake that. You yeah. know? Yeah, I'm so not. I'd like to find some other way of yeah. expressing it so it doesn't sound like, you know, when we say, I know who I am, yeah, I know who I am, I'm this, 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 this. I think it yeah. comes through the lens of compassion and open heart. Then mm -hmm. you don't have that solid something. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I'm a kind person, they're a kind person even though I'm seeing this yeah. or whatever through that lens, maybe. Yeah. Uh, that, and also an ability to admit our mistakes. Yeah? Not just, uh, you know, thinking uh, that I'm so good so I don't have to listen to their criticism. But, yes, I make mistakes and I can listen to their criticism and acknowledge the truth of it. Yeah. I don't have to defend myself against things that are true. Uh, it sounds so good when you say it, but it's so difficult to do when somebody attacks you, isn't it? Yeah. I was thinking it has something also to do with where you're placing your refuge. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. seems if, if, uh, more solid to me. If I place... Yeah, my uh, what I'm basing my life on on others' thoughts mm -hmm. about me versus the refuge that I try to develop. I think mm -hmm. that's much more stable for me. Mm -hmm. So when your refuge is not on what others think about you, because part of refuge is your own dharma practice, your own things that you've worked out, your own that part yeah. of it. The internalized part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if that is is full and rich inside of you, then uh, I I see it very much as we're able to evaluate ourselves more clearly, acknowledge our mistakes, and realize our good qualities, and then as a result, we don't need to prove ourselves to others, or be defensive if others point things out. My personal experience the, in terms of uh, previously what you were saying, when you were manifesting anger and then people pointing it out in, in ways that uh, you, you're talking about dismissing, you know, um, I personally feel it was really powerful when the like instead of uh, to me it's discounting like my experience is not real 
and you're telling me that it's not real. And and then when the receiving empathy totally changed the game because it uh, it created a, like some stability mm-hmm. and just acknowledging that this is your experience and that's it. Mm-hmm. And then to a certain point where with sufficient empathy, the anger couldn't come up. Yeah. I try as much as I would like. Mm-hmm. It could not get enough momentum mm-hmm. because there, there was a certain knowing that, okay, this is what you're experiencing, but it does not have to come out as a strategy of anger. Mm-hmm. It, because it's the, this thing about being seen and heard, that what you experience is being heard. Um, like when I was reading Archbishop Tutu's book, mm-hmm. what what they did with South Africa, the tribunal, where you know the victims came out and they spoke about their experiences, mm-hmm. and then they pardoned the perpetrators. They didn't. Mm-hmm. There was no punishment for those people. Yeah. But there was healing. So, just the act of being heard, what your your experience, yeah, was sufficient to. You know, a lot of those things could have manifested as a lot of angry acts. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that as uh, when we feel heard and we receive empathy from others, that helps us, uh, helps our own anger dissolve. It goes back to also what Venerable Tapa was saying, that the deeper feelings, a lot of it is you're sad, you know, you're feeling hurt, and mm-hmm. it 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 goes to very raw emotions. Mm-hmm. So anger manif- mask the vulnerability. Yeah, it has all that other stuff underneath it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, with some people, you know, the offering of empathy is what really helps them with their anger, and with other people, the offering of what we've just discussed about uh, owning our own emotions and being responsible helps them solve their anger. But these are, uh, here I'm talking about other people's anger, but also our own anger. Sometimes we need empathy, and sometimes we need somebody to say, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you, you know, you're contributing to this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we need very different strategies to help ourselves and help others. I find a strategy of just trying to see another's pain, to think about their suffering when, I'm, when I see somebody, if I'm angry at them or if I'm, especially if I'm angry at them because they're angry at me and there's a conflict going on, then yeah. to just see their suffering. And for me, that really diffuses that and I think it's kind of like, in a certain way, seeing their suffering and knowing that I have that same suffering, and it's a more um, real, more clear way of seeing the reality of the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Acknowledging their suffering. That it's hard to be angry at a person who's miserable. Well, it brings up a. A desire, a com- compassion, a yeah. desire for them to be free of their suffering. Yeah. But also, you know, what I find quite effective is when I feel somebody has harmed me or ruined my reputation or attacked me unjustly, I find it very effective to say, oh, it's so good that happened. Yeah? Because... It's the mind that's rejecting it, that's saying, no, 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 what you said is wrong about me. I've got to do that defensive mind is very, very painful. If I can look at it with a Dharma mind and say, oh, it's very good they insulted me. You know, it makes me more humble. It's very good that they blame me for something I didn't do. I have a, a chance to see the, uh, the object of negation. It's very good they ruin my reputation because I'm kind of uppity and arrogant. Yeah? And I find it this when I don't often remember it, but when I do remember it and I do say that, 
it then instantly that anger is gone. Instantly, you know. Gee, so good. They, you know, they did this and this to me. Very good. It really hurt my self-centered thought. So this is not masochism. It's not saying, oh, I'm a bad person, I deserve to suffer, and these kind people are making me suffer because I'm really such a jerk. It's not that. It's seeing that what, you know, it's a way of accepting what they say and do as something that is damaging our own internal enemy, our self-centered thought. You know? So, like... To rip my self-centered thought just got smashed in the face. Fantastic. Yeah. Instead of, you can't say that about me. I'm not like this. Da, 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 da. It's like, well, yeah, I am kind of egotistical and arrogant and, and self-centered. And the world isn't going along with that. And that's pretty realistic. And, you know, I really need to, like, open my eyes and wake up to this fact. So it's good this happened. Well, that's very advanced practice. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes um, thoughts, lines of thought like, oh, this is my karma, I've created this, can be very helpful. And yeah. sometimes that's the last thing I need to hear or want to hear. Yeah. I need to have a different approach. So I think there are different, there must be, we must have different approaches, like you say, different yeah. tools in our tool kit for different a moods or right. different situations. Right. Yeah. But the, the one about karma, you know, that's one I find also very effective. If I say, you know, this is due to my own actions, coming the wheel sharp weapons, coming full turn, it really cuts out the anger and, and upset. But what I find very interesting, and it happened this last retreat, it happened uh, when I did this uh, telephone panel last week, that people hear anger as, uh, and people hear karma as reward and punishment. Yeah? And, you know, as soon as, uh, you know, because in both situations I was just saying, you know, we do non-virtuous actions. We experience suffering. And I was just saying it like that. And twice in one week, people impute punishment on effect. Yeah? And it made me think, wow, how sensitive we are. Because hmm? nobody, you know, nobody's punishing us. It's just an effect of our own action. But like you said, sometimes we can accept that and sometimes we don't want to hear it. <laughs> Even though we say we believe in karma. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I think that there's a connection between these different approaches, actually. Mm -hmm. And that in one sense... Um, it has a lot to do with self-acceptance. Because my experience is that if these vulnerable emotions, as you call them, unless I can um, allow myself to feel them, which, you know, I wasn't even able to do at some points in my life, still have some difficulty recognizing fear. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm not aware that I'm angry, things like that. So, you know, that's the package I have. And, but I also see that, you know, learning how to work with that, not be scared of that, realizing how useful that is, mm -hmm. I actually really accept that in myself now. And even mm -hmm. though people here sometimes have different words and views, I actually don't accept those words or views. And I'm completely happy with that. It's helped me to move forward mm -hmm. because I accept these emotions in myself and it works for me to work through them. So I would never call... Um, I never would use the word meltdown. Some people use that word. I don't use, I will never use that word. I do know when that it's possible to um, wallow, <laughs> and that is useless. And learning to discern the difference between allowing yourself to feel and experience things and accepting them 
and wallowing are very different things. And so once I've had more self-acceptance, it's really worked much better for me to use some of these other approaches that you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. But I don't see them as so contradictory because I think it's actually a kind of self-empathy mm -hmm. that you've just got developed. I mean, I remember when I first moved here, I used to get upset with you because my practice was at like Nowheresville, very small, and yours was very advanced. And something would happen and you'd be over it immediately and I'd be like fuming for two weeks. And I would get angry at you because you would get over it so quickly. <laughs> you know? And, you know, that's natural. You know, but these things, uh, you know, those are the things that, at least for myself, have worked out. And I don't see these as very separate things. I think because we don't grow up with the kind of culture that allows us, we have to, it's taken most of us here in this room a long time to discern guilt from regret mm -hmm. and just realize, be okay that I'm a human being who makes mistakes and not go that extra step that goes to something that's really negative and self-centered. Mm -hmm. So once those things start getting worked out, then it's a lot easier to quickly, because you've gone through it so many times, just realize the self-centeredness and all this self-preoccupation and knock it down. But you can't get to that place, I don't think, until you've done some of this other work. Yeah, definitely. 